When I was ambulanced in front of a big portion of the student body and my teammates and having to be defibrillated and go through that trauma, it was like, okay, this is my reality with having a heart condition. And that was at the time that I really learned to embrace it. What is Epstein's anomaly? How did living with congenital heart defects influence Tori Geiger's career choice? What does having Epstein's anomaly mean for a newly married couple wanting a family? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the mother of an adult with a congenital heart defect. Alexander has undergone three open heart surgeries. He is my inspiration and the reason I became an advocate for the CHD community and the host of this program. Today's show is Resiliency, Overcoming Challenges with Epstein's Anomaly, and our guest is Tori Geiger. We'll start today's program by learning a bit about Tori in segment one. In the second segment, we're going to talk about becoming an advocate and an author. We will discover what Tori and her husband have planned for the future. Heart warrior Tori Geiger was diagnosed with Epstein's Anomaly and coartation of the aorta. She had open heart surgery at four days, two months, and seven months of age. She had an ablation for supraventricular tachycardia in seventh grade and in her freshman year of high school. These experiences have taught Tori a lot about resilience and overcoming obstacles. During school and college, Tori was a competitive athlete and still takes part in athletics today. She is the author of the inspirational book, From Vulnerable to Victorious, Turning Your Chronic Illness into Your Victory Story and has her own website and Instagram to motivate and inspire others. Tori lives with her husband, Devin, who is her best friend and business partner, and their pet, Golden Doodle Teddy. They hope to expand their family one day. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Tori. Thank you, Anna, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I am so happy to be talking to you, Tori. I just can't wait to hear more about your story and about what you have planned for the future. Let's start by having you tell us more about Epstein's anomaly, because I know that not all of my listeners know what that is. Epstein's anomaly is where the right side of your heart is enlarged and the flaps of your valve don't close all the way. So blood leaks back into the atrium of my heart, which basically is really inefficient. And that's kind of the biggest issue with Epstein's anomaly. So does that mean that you have basically a single ventricle heart? I believe my other ventricle is is fine. I think it's more just that that one is very inefficient. It still works, but my oxygen levels, just the efficiency in its entirety is just not very good. So have you had the Fontan procedure? I have not. I actually have not been operated on for my Epstein's. I've only been operated on for my coarctation of my aorta. Those were my open heart surgeries. Oh, wow. Did you have the surgery where they put a balloon inside of your vessel to open up that coarctation? Yes, I did. I had an angioplasty, I think is what it's called. That was my second procedure was that and it actually didn't work. I had my first open heart surgery where they attempted to fix it. Then my second one with the angioplasty and that didn't fix it entirely. And then I had my third surgery and that's when it actually was repaired. Wow. That's so much to go through. And you went through it at such a young age. Yes. I was four days old, like you were saying, and then two months and then seven months old. Wow. So the good thing is you probably don't really have any memory of any of those? Yeah, no memories, fortunately. My parents are the ones that remember most of it, for sure. (laughs) Now, you did go through some health scares when you were in school. So can you tell us about what those health scares were about and what procedures you had then? Yes. So in middle school, I was diagnosed with supraventricular tachycardia, which basically that fancy term means that my heart grew an extra node in the electrical pathway of my heart, which would cause my heart's rhythm to speed up very quickly. So I'd be exercising and then all of a sudden I'd sit down and, you know, your heart should be calming down at that point. And I'd just be sitting there and my heart would still be beating at, you know, 200 beats per minute. And you could see it pulsating out of my chest. It was very scary. And it's something that's really common when you have Epstein's. And Um, my parents were not surprised when I started developing rhythm issues because arrhythmias are super common when you have Epstein's. 
Okay. So did you have any ablations? I did. I had two ablations. I had one in seventh grade and then one in high school after a scary event in high school when I was ambulance from a high school basketball game and defibrillated three times in the ER in order to try to get my heart back to a stable rhythm because it was beating uncontrollably. Now those you do have a memory of, don't you? Yes, very much so. <laughs> was that very traumatic for you? It was a very traumatic event for me. And honestly, it was the event that really made my heart story. I think when it became my own, it, it became my own story at that point in my life. Whereas when I was a baby, that was kind of my parents' story. That was kind of their journey with the first so many months of my life. And then when I was ambulanced in front of a big portion of the student body and my teammates and having to be defibrillated and go through that trauma, it was like, okay, this is my reality with having a heart condition. And that was at the time that I really learned to embrace that this is the set of odds that I've been given, but I'm going to continue to move forward and embrace and own the story that I've been given. See, I really love that because when you're in high school and middle school, those are such difficult times to go through. Whether you have a heart defect or not, you're trying to fit in, you want to be like everybody else, and you have a congenital heart defect that doesn't allow you to be just like everybody else. Exactly. And I think that was something I dealt with so much growing up. I think you're treated so normally. I wasn't treated differently than other kids. Yes, there were times, you know, I had to pull myself out of drills or I had to be cognizant of a lot of things that other kids weren't, but I don't think it really hit me of how not normal I was until I hit high school and I was having to go through these events that no one my age had even had to go through anything kind of similar. And so that was a huge eye opener for me at that age in my life. So as if it's not bad enough that you had this coarctation to deal with, which you really didn't remember much, but then you had these arrhythmias, which you did remember. On top of all of that, you also had some valve issues, didn't you? I had a little bit of valve issues. They leak. That's pretty much the biggest issue. And eventually I might need to have another open heart surgery to repair my leaky valves. But as of now, I've been cleared and I'm healthy that I don't need those. And so that's kind of just the thing we're watching today at my annual checkups. That's great. So that's not something that's actually causing you much anxiety. It does affect my blood pressure. That's something I really have to watch. And that will be my battle is what doctors say. Um, the rest of my life is just battling my blood pressure just because with my Epstein's and the leakage and the inefficiency. But yeah, that's all I have to watch. And so I'm watching my stress watching what I eat and exercise and maintaining good blood pressure. When you went through the health scares that you did, which mostly involved your arrhythmias, what exactly did that teach you about overcoming obstacles? I think it really taught me just how much resilience I had built up in me. I realized that I could have more of an impact with the adversity that I go through. It really opened up my eyes to stop looking at the question, why me? Why is this my story? Why was I born with a congenital heart defect? And it allowed me to be able to bless others by the way that I walked through adversity and the lessons that I learned while walking through adversity. I can help others do the same. And I think I really realized that it's like a superpower, even though it's something I don't wish upon anyone to have to have a congenital heart defect, but I would say it's a superpower that makes me, me. And it's, it's taught me just what resilience and hard work and what mental toughness really looks like. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. 
The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Tori, let's start this segment by talking about your life today. You told me that you've been married for three years, so congratulations. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your life with your husband, Devin? I met my husband, Devin, in college. We were both on the track team at George Fox University. We were both high jumpers. We were good friends to start with, and then we started dating my freshman year. He was a junior when I was a freshman. And kind of the rest is history, I guess you could say. We got married when I was a senior in college. And so we immediately started a business after then I graduated college. And we still run that business today. And that's something that both of us enjoy doing. We're both accountants. Um, We have kind of a nerdy accounting and finance side. So we make a really good team, not only Mm -hmm. as business partners, but as husband and wife, for sure. I love it that you were friends first because there's such a fine line between love and hate that it's really easy to get really annoyed with your spouse. But when they're your best friend too, I think that line is a lot more blurred, don't you? Definitely. And I think it helped being teammates. You're mm-hmm. encouraging them to be the best teammate that they can be. And right. so I think we carried that mentality into our marriage, which has just been amazing. I, I'm very blessed that we have that. And it's been a way that we've been able to help each other grow as we have that teammate kind of mentality. And it does take a team to make a marriage work. It's not just one yeah. person. It's And it's not even just two people. It's two people working together as a team to really have that successful, enriching marriage where you feel like your relationship hopefully is growing and getting better and deeper every day that goes on. I totally agree. You said in your bio that you and Devin were interested in starting a family in the future. So what does having Epstein's anomaly and arrhythmias mean for a newly married couple who may want to start a family? Growing up, I was always told I probably wouldn't be able to have kids myself. That was something that really became real for me in high school. I had a lot of conversations with my parents that told me, you know, this is what we've been told. But as I've gotten older and they've watched my heart, they have cleared me. My cardiologist said, yeah, you're cleared. But if you do, you have a one in 20 chance of passing your CHD along to your kids. And you also will be a very high risk pregnancy. So that might mean bed rest for pretty much a majority of a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So we keep those things in mind. There's some other options we've been looking into, such as doing IVF with a surrogate. So it would still be Devin's and my child, but we would go through a surrogate. And I think kind of something unique that I learned from another CHD warrior is that they could even potentially look at the eggs and see if there is a gene for my CHD and then not use those eggs when they're doing an implant into a surrogate. And so um, that's something that's very intriguing for us. Of course, we're looking at adoption as well Mm -hmm. as an option. For me personally, it can speed up my need for a valve replacement. And that's something Mm -hmm. I've been really working on to not ever need necessarily. And so I think those are kind of the questions and the the circumstances we've been kind of playing around with as we've been looking at building a family. I think it's fascinating. Do you know genetically if there is a deletion or some kind of problem with your genome? This whole time, we didn't realize it was genetic, but there's a very good likelihood it is. Mm -hmm. And so I know as we're exploring that conversation, I definitely want to get that mapped. The more people who have congenital heart defects who go through this mapping to see if there's a deletion or if there is some kind of problem with the genome, that's just going to give us so much more information that maybe they could prevent these heart defects from occurring at all. 
I know people ask me, they're like, well, what if your baby has CHD? I said, oh, that's totally like, I know how to raise a CHD baby because I know what it's like growing up with it, but I wouldn't wish it upon my own children. If I can help it, I don't want to pass that along to them. I'm going to try to do whatever I can to make sure that they're as healthy as possible. Of course, you want to make sure that you optimize your baby's opportunity for growth, development, and just to be able to have a healthy life. Is there anything in your treatment that would need to be changed if you were to start working to have a family? Right now, I'm not on any medication, so nothing like that has to change. But I would say more lifestyle has to change, especially if I do want to carry my own children, the amount of bed rest that would be needed is a lot and would be for a majority of my pregnancy. In addition to hospital visits, I was told this by a doctor that it might be like every week or every other week I would be needing to go in for just close monitoring. And so right now I'm a very busy gal. I own a couple businesses that keep me on my toes. And so for us, it's a lot of lifestyle things that would have to slow down and have to maybe simplify a little bit more. So number one, my stress is a little bit lower than what it is right now. And that my schedule isn't as jam packed because I will need to dedicate even more time to rest and making sure that my body is doing what it needs and what my heart needs to. You were saying before that you're a little bit concerned that if you get pregnant, that that could accelerate deterioration of your valves. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? And if there is anything preemptively that they can do to try and protect your valves? They haven't said if there's anything preemptively that they can do to protect my valves. They're kind of just there and we'll do what we can and monitor. That's kind of been their approach for most of my life and still kind of is. And so really it's just a lot of stress on the valves. It could cause them to leak a lot more and that would then cause me to need to have a valve replacement just because if the leakage gets too much, then it can cause even more issues. You go down the road of cardiac arrest, lots of different things. Do you think that if you and Devin decide that you want to try in earnest to have your own baby naturally, that you might consider having valve surgery beforehand so that you don't have to worry about that while you're pregnant? I had explored that and I was told that if I had to have a valve replacement, it would be likely I'd be on blood thinners for probably the rest of my life is what I was told. If I'm on blood thinners, then I wouldn't be able to get pregnant. You have such a complicated environment (laughs) when you're considering the valves and your busy lifestyle and everything else that you have going on. When do you think you might actually start in earnest or make that decision whether or not you're going to have a baby naturally versus going with the surrogate or adoption? I think we will definitely know in the next probably two years. That's kind of our timeline that we've been putting forth as when we are kind of getting the genome tested, we're getting all that kind of done. And then I would say probably we wouldn't be looking at having a child in probably for five years, I would say. But you're so young, you have plenty of time to do that and to get your business established and write your book and become a speaker like you're already doing. But I think it's smart that you're already investigating what the situation may be for you, whether or not you want to have your genome mapped, whether or not you want to consider having a surrogate, what that means, because none of this stuff is easy. There's a lot of different factors. And, you know, there's the emotional factor too, that you have to play in of what that's going to look like. And I know for me, when I'm hormonal, my heart does funny things. My blood pressure is a little bit different when I'm hormonal and just hormones do a lot of different things. And so that's a risk we have to look into when I'm pregnant, there's a lot of hormones going crazy. And so (laughs) what will that do for my heart if my hormones already make my heart a little bit iffy? Sometimes I have some weird arrhythmia episodes that happen pretty much the same time of the month. (laughs) Well, that's good that you're aware of that and that that could be something that is predictive of whether or not you might have some problems. Yes. So those are all factors that we're just carefully analyzing. 
Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. In this segment, Tori, I'd like to talk to you about your book. But before we get into that, how did living with congenital heart defects influence your career choice? It influenced my career choice a lot. Originally, growing up, I wanted to be a doctor. And then I had that traumatic event in high school that really changed that trajectory. I've always kind of had a knack for business too. So that was always in there too growing up. But it wasn't really until high school that that solidified. I was not going down the medical route and I would be going down the business route. And I have a very entrepreneurial kind of mindset. I would say my CHD has taught me to be very creative in life. And I think that really helps me as a business owner today. I graduated with an accounting and finance degree. And I've always known just in the back of my mind that I wanted to do something that impacted others that had CHD like me, had chronic illness just like me. And so I actually developed a business in college that was centered around doing just that. It was an active wear line. And that business didn't go anywhere right after college, but it kept it more in the back of my mind that this is, yes, something I want to do and use my business skills to make an impact. And so it wasn't until January of 2021 that then I decided, you know, I'm going to take the plunge. I already have an established company. I'm going to start another one with the aim and the focus to really give back to CHD. And that's when I founded my blog and my platform where I produce my books and my speaking. And that's my business today. You knew what you wanted to do. You made plans. And you really honed in on what your message is and your why, which I think is just so critical to be a successful businesswoman. It's helped a lot. And I think it's helped me fuel my purpose. I think Mm -hmm. CHD has given me a really big purpose. And it's fun to see just the impact that I can have on other people by sharing the experiences I've gone through and also the lessons that I've learned. And if I can help them learn some of these lessons before they necessarily have to go through it themselves, I think that's that's a huge win. Oh, absolutely. Well, I have noticed that on Instagram, you're so good about posting helpful information about resilience and overcoming adversity. Can you tell us how your experience led you to actually write that book? I felt like there was a lot of negativity that I saw in in the chronic illness space, but specifically in just the CHD space, there was a lot of just not a lot of hope. And for me, hope's a big, big part of who I am. And so I kind of saw that need and I journal a lot. That's Mm -hmm. a huge way of how I express the emotions I'm going through and just the experiences I've, I've had. And so I've journaled for a really long time. And that kind of from those entries I learned, I was like, man, I have a lot of lessons and tips that I think mindset wise, or even just tools that I've used that have helped me get through some really hard, rough patches with my heart condition that I think would be a benefit to other people. And so Mm -hmm. I, I started just taking those tips and it just became a book and I just kind of laid it all out and kind of made it flow like a book should. And that was the beginning. So tell us where people can find your book on the internet. And then tell us about your Facebook tribe. You can find my book on Amazon. You can find it on the Kindle store or the regular Amazon marketplace. There's a paperback, a hardback, and a Kindle version. And so whatever kind of reading platform you like, it's there. 
and there is an audiobook coming out 2022 so be on the lookout on Amazon for that as well they'll have some bonus interviews with my parents and my brother and husband on what does it look like to have a tribe around you getting a little bit more of their perspective so that's where you can check that out and then I have a Facebook group that's for women and women affected by chronic illness. It's a support group just for us to come together, encourage each other, offer tips, support, ask questions. And it's just a fun way to connect on Facebook. And that is the TJG Victory Tribe on Facebook. I will be putting a link to that in the show notes. So if you're on your exercise bike or you're driving to work, don't worry about grabbing a pen and writing anything down. Be safe. And you could just click on that in the show notes. I love it that you have a Facebook tribe for women. Did they help you when it came to determining whether or not you liked the way you put your book together? Were they some of your beta readers? They were not. The group actually came after the book. I wanted a way for people that read the book to be able to then connect after they had read it. And so that's what sparked the Facebook group. What was the biggest lesson that you learned in actually writing a book, Tori? It's not something that everybody does. I know so many people who have said, I want to write a book, or I think there's a book in me. But to actually go through from beginning to middle to end, that is really, really special. I think the biggest lesson I learned was just always coming back to the reason behind why you're writing the book. I think for me, I I faced a lot of trauma as I was reliving a lot of the events, especially in high school that I went through. I was reprocessing a lot of emotions that I had journaled about. And so to have to relive some of those traumatic events was very difficult. And there were times imposter syndrome sets in of like, am I the right person to be saying this? Is is this right? Is this, it just came down to, this is my story. I know God has given me this story and I'm going to share it. And it, it might not be perfectly written, but it's, it's written. And I know that it's going to make an impact no matter what. And just remembering that my why behind it is that impact. And as long as I'm keeping that at the forefront, of what I'm doing, then I'm doing it right. And you're also becoming more of a speaker. Talk to us about that. I'm learning more about my podcasting skills and (laughs) learning more about just speaking in front of a lot of people. I've gotten to speak at some heart events, just encouraging whether that's parents or um, other CHD warriors like myself. But that's something new that I'm exploring and I'm learning to get better at it and more effective. So that's something that's in the pipeline for future. I love that. I think you have a lot of positive messages to share. And I think you're such a good role model for younger people who are just maybe coming to grips with the fact that they have a congenital heart defect. You know what it's like to be confronted with it in front of the entire school. I'm sure that was mortifying in some ways, but you were able to turn that on its head and make it something positive. And that is exactly what our kids today need to see. That's a huge mission of mine in life is just showing other heart warriors, other people that deal with chronic illness, that their condition, their circumstances do not define who they are or what they're capable of. It's just a way that empowers them to make impact. I think if we take the focus off of ourselves, off of that inward focus, and we're able to use those experiences for an outward focus to bless and encourage and love on others, then we're always going to live a full and blessed life, no matter our circumstances. Oh my goodness. That is so beautiful. I love that. You are wise beyond your years, Tori. (laughs) Thank you. I've had some amazing mentors and parents that have definitely poured into me and helped me have a healthier mindset around my adversity, which has made all the difference in my life. Oh, I just think your parents are so lucky that you're willing to verbalize that. There aren't a whole lot of times when your children say, hey, mom and dad, you did a great job. So the fact that you just gave them those accolades means so much to me as a heart mom to hear that. I'm so glad. Is there anything you want to say to mom and dad right now? I would just say thank you, thank you, thank you. Your touch and your legacy is getting passed to so many more people beyond what you know. And that's because of the hard work, the dedication, the prayers, the tears, and everything that you guys have poured into both me and my brother Grant. 
Well, one last thing before we close, you are now a member of the Heart Community Collection. And I'm so excited about that since I'm one of the founding members. Do you want to talk a little bit about what it means to you to be a member of the Heart Community Collection? Yes, of course. I just love being a part of that community, just being able to connect with other heart warriors. I've gotten to interview some that are in the group already and just connecting with business owners or anybody that just has a connection with the heart community is amazing to be able to hear each other's stories. And I think we feed off of each other's energy and positivity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's something just so powerful about being able to come together and share amazing resources. And so I think that's the biggest way we can be advocates for CHD is to come together in groups like that and work together and help each other, whether that's helping each other with the dreams and the visions that we have for our businesses or our lives. It was fun being on a call the other day and hearing other authors talking about approaches that they've done for marketing or different things like that that have helped them. And to be able to be in a part of a community that's like that is just amazing. Oh, I agree a hundred percent. I think by working together, there's so much more that we can do than when you're all by yourself out there in the world where exactly. there's so many other people who are writing books. How do you make your book stand out? And I think one of the ways that we make our books stand out, we make our resources stand out is when other people in the community say, yeah, this is great. They give you that endorsement. They believe in your message. They believe in what you're doing. We all need that. We need somebody else who believes in us, maybe even more than we believe in ourselves, because that's what's going to push us forward and help us make that resource available to everybody. Exactly. You nailed it. Well, sweetheart, thank you so much for coming on the program today. I have thoroughly enjoyed talking with you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. It was so much fun for me too. And that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a review of our podcast on Apple Podcasts or YouTube or wherever you listen to the podcast. That will help other people to anticipate what they're going to hear when they listen to our program. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time, wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.